But we begin with the yin-yang, symbol of the Taoist approach to life. The yin yang, symbolizing the opposites of life, not divided by a razor sharp line, good on one side, evil on the other. Each takes up its abode in the deepest citadel of the other by virtue of the black dot in the white domain and the white dot in the black domain. Symbolizing the mystery of the relationship between the opposites that characterize and make up our lives and how they can be united, brought together. Oh, uh, man, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Just <laughs> elevates me <laughs> to look at that. <laughs> Chinese will say you can learn more about life by contemplating this yin-yang symbol. Of course, this comes out in many stories. Let me tell you a short one, because one of my favorites, about the man who, uh, whose horse ran away, and his neighbor, Solicitus, comes over to commiserate with him, and all the man says, who knows what's good and bad. And sure enough, the next day, the horse returned with a drove of wild horses that it had encountered. So now the man was rich with horses. So the neighbor comes hopping over to congratulate him on his good fortune. And again, all the man would say is, who knows what's good or bad? And sure enough, the next day, his son tries to ride one of the uh, wild horses, falls off, break his leg. Again, the commiseration, and again, the same response, who knows? And uh, once more, who does know? Because the next day, the military came conscripting for the army, and the son didn't have to go because of the broken leg. It's a simple parable, but it just illustrates the intertwining of these things that we tend to put in different boxes and think of them as the sharp antagonists. And what does this say about the essence of Confucianism then? Let me say that uh, Confucianism and Taoism are not uh, divided, and this is part of the yin-yang, in sharp compartments. It's really not accurate to think of them as different uh, rela uh, religions, because it's more like a single religion that in Chinese they would call it the Da Zhao. Uh, which uh, church are you uh, belong to? I belong to the Great Church, of course which includes Confucianism and Taoism and Buddhism and a good smattering of shamanism and folk religion thrown in. Every Chinese traditionally was a Confucianist on state occasions, like our Memorial Day parade and things like that, of uh, when illness fell, they would call in the Taoist sages up in the mountains they know about these healing herbs, and also they know about spirit. And then when death comes, why then you come call in the Buddhist priest, because they knew about these 
afterlife, reincarnation, and other realm. We Chinese, you know, we're flat-footed. We don't know. We know about this world, but you can't be too safe and careful, so we better tap their wisdom about what's going to happen after that. So, as I say, all three of these uh, uh, coalesce into one. And if I can take the time for a little uh, enjoyable anecdote, a long time ago when I was explaining this principle about how in China the religions are related differently than in the West, not as competitors, why the next day a student brought me a Dear Abby column which made this point <laughs> with a graphicness I could not have conceived. It was a short letter, I'll read it. Uh, 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 I'll remember it. Uh, Dear Abby, I am uh, 31 years old uh, uh, and attractive, and I'm interested in religion. Uh, I am a member of the First Methodist Church, Blessed Angels Catholic Church, and Banea Muna Synagogue. Uh, I also attend Christian Science Services, uh, so I do take aspirin occasionally. <laughs> uh, please, I'm interested in getting married. Can you tell me how I can meet a man who is interested in any or all of these religions? Signed, Ida. Now comes back, Abby. Dear Ida, you seem to have the bases covered. And then, but now, the lectern. I do not see how you can belong to all these religions. Well, of course, Abby couldn't see that because she was Western. But for a Chinese, there would be no problem at all because these religions service different components of the human self. And you ask, how does this relate to Confucianism? Well, this basic attitude toward the intertwining of the opposite just pervades all Chinese culture, and if we want to be literal, we can say Confucianism and Taoism, too, are in this whole, but each laps over into the domain of the other. You were strongly influenced, were you not, by growing up in China. I mean, you began in this small village, right? <laughs> Zanzo. That's my hometown. It's located 70 miles northwest of Shanghai. And the only way we could get to Shanghai was five hours by barge and another hour on a train from Suzhou. Every childhood, if you know nothing different, seems perfectly ordinary, the way the world is ordained. Of course we knew that we were different. Ours was the only house in town that had a porch, and I remember the most fragrant roses there after breakfast, the whole servant's family would come in and there would be a reading of a chapter in the Bible and the singing of a hymn. My mother taught piano as her mission. A mountain rose just a few feet back from our house. On top, there was a pagoda built to incarcerate evil spirits. Most of the religion that lapped around us in this tiny village was folk religion, which centers in evil spirits, of which they're innumerable and mostly bad. So the Christian message that my parents brought gave a certain population in this town a spiritual anchorage 
that the folk religion that lapped around them did not. When we looked down the uh, back window in cold weather as well as warm, we would see people on the mountain doing their Tai Chi Chuan, you know, early in the morning. And even though the, as you know, the gestures are so graceful, choreographed, looks as much like a dance as a physical exercise. In the cold weather, you could see the steam coming from their body because of the intensity of the metabolic processes that were released by these gestures. You brought this with you. <laughs> this is my first primer because so our uh, education was English. Three afternoons a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they would import a tutor, and he would give us uh, uh, the rudiments of a Chinese education. You remember it still? I don't even have to look at the words, but they found it goes, Kuku di di, kuku da di di, xiao kuku bo di di, ho kuku ho di di, ni an ngu ngu an ni, kuku chang ku ngu pa ju, ngu yu san wo ye da er xiao. Shall I translate? Sure. The meaning is Chinese too. Big brother is big. Little brother is little. Big brother carries little brother. Good big brother. Good little brother. I love you. You love me. You see the family emphasis coming in right in the first words that they read. While you were doing that, I was singing. Uh, I was repeating, see John Run, see Mary Run. <laughs> Look, see? Look and see. And that's illustrative, too, because we are empiricists in the West. It's the fruition in modern science which arose in the West and nowhere else. So what would you say has been the essence of Confucianism's contribution to the world? It, I, I would say it is in the area of social relationships. Uh, nothing is more important in Confucianism than the five constant relationships. And these are the five places where human lives intersect. The first is parent and child. The second is spouse and spouse. The third is elder brother and younger brother. The fourth is elder friend and younger friend. And the fifth is ruler and subject. Now, as every individual makes its way, his or her way through society, we're always in the midst of these cross currents of human relationships. And it's exactly within that weather system of these currents going on all the time and how we comport ourselves in the face of those currents that our destiny depends. No, this is not yogis up in the cave for 40 years by themselves. Confucius uh, had no use for that as a way to become human. We work out our humanity in these cross currents of human relationship. But now, how do we face them? It's like uh, uh, our wings. Everything depends on how our wings are set. If they're tilted at the right angle, then as we these currents of human relationships come towards us every day, we will mount and our full humanity will blossom. But if our wings are slightly tipped downward, then we'll go devolving into the atrocities that human life can lead to. Now, what is the secret of 
whether the wings are tipped up or tipped down. And their word is wren. Wren, which uh, in terms of the pictograph is composed of uh, two radicals. The first is for a human being. You have a torso and two legs. And then the second is two lines, two human beings. So wren is the ideal relationship between any two human beings. And the heart of that relationship is empathy. Can I empathize with your feeling and your interest? And to the extent that we, I can, then my wings are tipped up and moving through these human, as these human relationships come at us every day, why my maturity will increase. A sound man's heart is not shut within itself, but it's open to the hearts of others. 